Welcome to Prison Professors. Today, I am super enthusiastic to introduce you to Shelly Miles. Shelly has a really distinguished position, a very important position in, I think I would say, all across the nation in teaching and inspiring people about financial literacy through the Singleton Foundation. And I had the honor of meeting her because of a project I participated on with her and just reached out and asked if she would share her story about leadership and developing her career so that we could share it with more people in jail and prison. Um, they hopefully get the same message that we try to teach through our different courses. We can see that I'm not asking anybody to do anything that another leader doesn't do. So, so Shelly, I, I really want to thank you for, for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk with us at Prison Professors. Well, Michael, thank you so much for having me on your podcast, on your show today. I'm thrilled to be here and honored that you asked me. Well, what we'd really like to do, besides hearing about the really noble mission of the Singleton Foundation, is learn a little bit about you as well and your pathway to leadership and how you grew to, to, to become the CEO of a major philanthropic organization that has the power to influence certainly thousands or tens of thousands or millions of lives, lives through your media platform, one of which I, get, I had the, the privilege of participating in. So why don't we start by just telling us about how you became involved with the Singleton Foundation? Well, I, I was very fortunate. I got a call one day uh, from an, an old boss of mine who I'd met early in my career who said, I'd like you to meet my friends, the Singletons. They are very passionate about financial literacy and inspiring entrepreneurs, and they're working on a very interesting project, and I think you might like to meet them. So it was very serendipitous. I had the opportunity to meet them, and when they told me about their mission about inspiring entrepreneurship and making financial literacy kind of fun and engaging for people um, and wanting to reach all these people to make this education available to everyone, um, I was hooked because I knew from my own life how important it is um, to have financial skills and to be able to take control of your life. So one of the, one of the missions that we try to do as our team is, is teach people who are really overrepresented in, in prison or people that, that didn't have access to that knowledge of financial literacy. And, and a lot of times circumstances in their lives led them into making decisions that put them into the criminal justice system. So we really want to give them that same message. So I, I think that we're in alignment, but maybe you could help us a little bit by just giving us your interpretation of what does it mean to be an entrepreneur? What does an entrepreneur do? An entrepreneur is someone who solves problems clear and simple. You see a problem, you come up with a solution for the problem, and you try to bring it to life. Uh, entre entrepreneurs use their creativity and imagination to fix things. And, and doing that, they might work for themselves, they might start a business, or they might even work for someone else and bring all sorts of skills to the table. It's about starting out and um, and fixing things. Yeah, and, and I think that you, you summed it up really quite nicely when you said it's about building solutions. And that's really, I think, I hope that the people that are going through our course, if they're in a jail or a prison, they remember that the first module in this course is defining success, is figuring out there is a problem. And that problem can be any number of things like overcoming substance abuse. It could be developing an education so that I can get a, a GED. It could be preparing myself for a job. All of those are problems and we define success by getting there. Maybe you could help us understand a little bit about how you applied that principle of defining success in your own life as you developed your career. How did you, how, did, how was it or why was it that at some point in your life, somebody looked at you and said, oh, we're gonna start this concept of financial literacy and we really want you to be a part of it. What, well, what was your background like that, that, that led them to, to recognize you as the ideal candidate? So my career has been long and varied. Um, you know, I was fortunate that I lived in a family where I was able to go to college but I almost didn't because one day I overheard my mom, my dad saying to my mom, oh, maybe we shouldn't send her to college. She's going to grow up and just get married and be home and never become anything. 
And I think that, <laughs> that kind of got me really interested in going to school and working really hard and trying to be successful. Um, I started working when I was 12, um, sold shoes, worked in a bookstore, babysat, cleaned the mirrors <laughs> and all these things and kept working all the way through college, uh, doing more interesting things. I had an opportunity to work at an accounting firm for a couple of years while I was in school and grade papers and give music lessons and ended up becoming a CPA. And after being a CPA for a couple of years and working hard, um, I had an opportunity to have my dream come true and I went to work for the Walt Disney Company. And at the Walt Disney Company, I started out as an auditor. Um, but then because of some problems I uncovered uh, in accounting at the music company there, they offered me the opportunity to become the head of finance for the music company. And from there, they were having problems attracting a certain person they wanted to work with. And because I love reading comic strips, I sat up and wrote comic strips to help them attract this person. And the person came into the company. And um, I was pretty soon given the opportunity to run the record company worldwide. Um, and then they wanted to start a software division and make video games. <laughs> and I was lucky because we had the capacity in my division to uh, distribute things and package them. And we had warehousing and all the things we needed. And so the only part we didn't know about was video games. So we went out and learned how to do that. Um, and after I left the Walt Disney Company, I went to work for a number of small startups. One was a software company, which made sense. And they made animation software. And that company was struggling a little bit. And so we uh, figured out how to fix it and sold it and um, went on to another startup. And I worked in a number of startups, uh, many of which were six, a couple of which were successful and some which were failures. Um, and I, I learned a lot from those um, and eventually ended up in, a, in another entertainment company and all those things that I learned from all those things that went well and all those things that didn't go so well, um, I think gave me the, the skills. And because the singletons were interested in creating a game and they were interested in entertainment, they reached out to, my, to their friend who happened to have been my boss for a lot of the years when I was learning all these things. So when he was looking for somebody, he called me. Well, that is a, a perfect story for anybody who's starting out in their life because what we've just listened and learned from, from Shelly is that currently she leads a very high position in, in would, we, would we call this the, I mean, you went through the corporate arena, but right now it's the philanthropic arena, I guess, right? It's, yeah, it's the Singleton Foundation for Financial Literacy and Entrepreneurship. We're a nonprofit. So yeah. We're here to help people. And, and, but she's risen from the corporate sector, but that's not where she started. And, and it's important to listen to the humble beginnings that, 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 that where she began, which was babysitting and, and uh, working in a bookstore and just gradually working her way up and developing new skills along the way, studying hard in college. But it all started with this commitment, this commitment of setting small goals and working our way through them. And I think that we will see that as a pattern of anybody who achieves a high level of success. They always started someplace and just built upon one success after another success. When you started working at Disney as a CPA, it was a CPA you started at Disney? Yeah, I was a, what's called an internal auditor. So we would go around and check things and this, things that uh, different partners and licensees were doing in different departments and it was a great way to learn about what other people did. But when you started in that role, did you see yourself growing to be the CEO or director of big, of big corporations when, uh, you, when you started there? No, not at the time. I was just so thrilled to go work there and, um, and started having the opportunity to learn and meet people. And as opportunities knocked on, you know, opportunity knocks on the door, sometimes really quietly, um, I was lucky enough to get to walk through that door. 
you know, you could say that you were lucky, but I, I, I think that a lot of times that, you know, we, we've got to recognize that the harder we work, the luckier we get. Somebody much smarter than me came up with that quote, but I've always liked it. You know, if you work really hard, you get lucky. If you put yourself, uh, surround yourself with people like you did, people are going to notice that you are uh, contributing and that you're a member of the team and they look to you and say, to help us develop in, in, in other ways. Um, and, 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 and thank you so much for sharing that background with us. Let's turn a little bit more to the Singleton Foundation and talk about some of the exciting projects that you are working on um, to, to help people learn financial literacy. So one of the really exciting projects we're working on is a media channel called Million Stories. And Million Stories is entertainment and it's designed to inspire people and let them see themselves through entertainment to lead them to the learning. So one of my favorite projects that we've worked on, having failed at a lot of things myself, is a, is a program called Faceplant, which is the one that we invited you to participate in because through our failures, it gives us an opportunity to get up, dust ourselves off, figure out what we did wrong, and move forward. And we're so thrilled that we were able to have you on the show. Yeah, and I was really, really grateful to participate and to be able to share the story because I think that a lot of people that come from a background like I come from, which is one of, um, you know, making a series of really bad decisions as a young man, we, we have a preconceived idea of what's going to happen. Like when I tell somebody I, I was sentenced to 45 years in prison, people have an idea of what's going to be the outcome for that. And, and it's been my job ever since then to work to, to, to disrupt that mindset and disrupt that uh, mindset, not only for my own life, but also to show other people that regardless of what challenges you're going through right now, you can pick yourself and, 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 and build yourself up. And how, how is it that you are measuring your success with this program? What are the metrics and the tools that you use to see if this is an effective, uh, effective program? So, th so that this program is different than for-profit companies I've worked for because in a for-profit company, you can measure your success by looking at your financial statements and your return on investment. But in a nonprofit, we're really looking at impact and how we impact people's lives. So that would be things like how many people took, place, took part in the programs and watched the various shows that we have what did they do? Did they turn to the learning content? Did they read something else um, and, and watch another video? And so we've set up a whole series of metrics that we check every day uh, to see what the successes are. So some are really small successes and some are larger. We might ask ourselves every day, we wanted people to know about this show, so we advertised it. And how did the advertising work? Did it bring people to watch the show or didn't it work? When people started watching the show, was it engaging? Did they watch the whole thing? Were they interested enough to watch another show? Or did they click on the dive deeper button and decide to take one of the lessons? And when they got to the lessons, did they complete the lesson? How many lessons did they complete? So every day, we're looking at different ways to measure if what we're doing is working or not. Could you tell me how you're distributing the program so that people can find it? I know that, I know that if, it, it, it's sometimes difficult to catch these eyeballs. What's the strategy that you use to, to get people to find the, the show? So right now, we know that a lot of people are participating um, in platforms like Instagram. And so... We are speaking to people where we can. We're advertising on Instagram and other platforms. And we choose different audiences to reach out to that we think might be interested in the show. So our major demographic is millennials, um, which we pick because they're a big audience and there's a lot of need to learn this information. And we've also, uh, you know, we talk to the media and all the ways that we might find people, and then we can see what's working and what's not. And so far, you know, we've recent, very recently launched, and the shows have been very, very popular, and people are coming to our site. In fact, your show in particular was very popular, and I know people really love to hear your story. 
Would it be okay? I mean, you said that you're distributed because the people in prison, they don't have the ability to, to click on the internet, but, and I, and I don't, wouldn't want to put you on the spot, but if it is, it, would it be okay if I uh, put excerpts of that so they'd get an idea of look at some of the face plant shows and I could splice them into this uh, interview? Or is there some um, protocol can, that I have to do to do that? Pardon? Um, we, we can get you that information. And yeah, let me know if there's a, if there's a possibility because I'd like the people to actually see how a program goes from an idea and a concept and how we're teaching this message to people. And because those people will never have access to the internet while they're inside, but while listening to you, it might bring some bring some constant context to what we're talking about. Yeah, and we would love people to see some of the shows. You know, in addition to Faceplant, we have shows like American Paycheck, which is all about how young people make money and spend money and, um, and adulting with Richard Sherman, which is all about making financial decisions that are smart um, and a show called milk money, which is about parenting and the price of parenting. Um, so well, if pe if even, if, even if the people inside don't have the ability to see it, we, I'd, I will certainly be, um, talk it, writing about it in the show notes, which they will get, so they can pass it along to their family members, because this is really the, the, the intergenerational cycle of, of struggle that we're trying to break with our program. A lot of times, people in jail and prison, the reality is their, their children are much more likely to come into the system unless we break the cycle, and financial literacy is really a big part of that. What are some... Oh, go ahead. I was going to say financial literacy is really key. And we've done some research and found that, you know, one of the issues is, is that a lot of people don't, haven't learned about financial literacy in school. And a lot of parents don't talk about it. Uh, we did some research with a university. And as we were planning million stories, we really wanted to see if our hunches were correct about why people might not engage with information. And we found that you know, there's kind of a taboo about talking about money. People aren't comfortable about it. A lot of parents don't have the information or might be embarrassed or, and don't talk to their children about it. And a lot of people are worried that it's really hard or confusing and complicated. And really the principles aren't very hard to learn. It's a matter of taking the time to learn the skills because learning about financial literacy Money is a big part of our lives. It affects us in so many ways. Um, and in the same ways that you want to eat well and you want to exercise, you need to start to learn about money and you have to take little steps before you can take the big steps. And when you say that you're teaching about financial literacy, does that talk about like investments? Does it talk about budgeting? Does it talk about, um, you know, advancing your career or all of the above? So, so we cover all kinds of topics, everything from starting an emergency fund to getting out of and staying out of debt, uh, budgeting, which is really planning for your life, how to invest for your future, what is compound interest all about. And we also cover topics like entrepreneurship and you know, what are the things you need to do to have a business, what do all the different terms mean. So. And they're married to the entertainment topic. So entertainment topics kind of let you know why you want to know this stuff and you can see what other people are doing. And then the learning topics are the basic things that you and skills that you need to master in order to be able to plan your own financial future and really take control of your life. Could you tell us about, do you have exercises on there? Because, because I think I heard you say earlier that you could download and take next steps or dive, dive deeper. Are there interactive exercises that people can go through uh, to develop their literacy skills? And, and if so, yeah. tell us about them. Yeah, so they're on the resources section in our site and there's, oh, probably 50 different lesson plans in there um, that are done in small, you know, small increments of five minutes at a time where you can learn about these topics. And some are, have videos to go with them, some are more written, some are interactive, but it's a really robust collection of, of information. And, and do, do people get graded on those assignments or is it all self-directed? It's all self-directed. So the idea is that you can do it as you can when you have the time and you can do it in chunks that are interesting to you or you can follow through in a sequenced manner. 
And, and I take it these are all uh, free. Anybody can go through them they want, that wants to try. Right, they're free. We want everybody to have access to this information because we think it's so important. Have, have you considered trying to introduce this curriculum to, to jail and prison administrators? You know, we, we have not done that at this time. Our focus is getting it out as broadly as we can. Um, and so we've been focusing on getting our channel launched so people could have access to it. You yeah, know, they need they need to have access to the internet to get this information. Is that right? Yeah, you need to have that access to the internet. And is it primarily available on uh, designed for a mobile device, or do you, do you, should you be at a computer to use this these um, tools? Either. So it's it's very mobile friendly. We designed everything to be mobile first, um, and then it also works on all kinds of computers anywhere the internet is accessible. And how many people are on the team at the Singleton Foundation that, that participated in this project? You know, it's a pretty small team. There are, and we have a couple of different projects um, that we're working on, but altogether there's about under 20 of us. Um, I went out to find people that know a lot more about what they do than I know about what they do. So um, we have a lot of people from the entertainment industry, from the BBC, Disney, Lionsgate, Sony, Universal, DreamWorks. Um, and so they're all experts at what they do. And uh, we also work with some people outside the company, but it's a small team that's really passionate and cares about this cause uh, that are working hard to put this together and bringing all of their talents and experience to bear. Did you say that part of the curriculum includes uh, career development or did, was that something that I said and I wanted to hear? <laughs> um, more entrepreneurship, but a lot of, uh, rather than pure career development, but there's a lot of things about planning your career. But our I real focus is on financial literacy and inspiring entrepreneurship uh, and, you know, learning how to fail as you do, which is why we did face plant is, and how to recover from those failures is a lot of being an entrepreneur, and in, including other things like perseverance and problem solving and being creative and all those, all those other attributes. Yeah, I, I think that, that, that people watching our show, they hear me talking a lot about the importance of understanding it's really important to learn how to develop your own income stream because the market is not well, we live in the world as it exists. And, and as it exists, it's very difficult for somebody with a criminal background to find the type of career that is, that is open traditionally to people that don't have a criminal background. And so a, a show like, uh, like, like the type that, that are offered by the Singleton Foundation, I know that there's more than Faceplant, but those types of shows are really just the thing that somebody needs to learn to, to figure out, well, if the world's not gonna be opening job opportunities for me, I've gotta learn how to do it myself. And the, the, the tools that, that we try to teach, I think are probably the same as the tools that you had to use when you were uh, launching startup software companies and so on, which is finding partners, creating collaborative relationships. Tell us if you have, if you have a, a curriculum that teaches that, that pattern of, of, of opening, of networking and things of that sort, is that part of the financial literacy program as well? Uh, that's more on our inspiring entrepreneurship side. So we have some tools in that area. And right now we're in the process of expanding them greatly. We think it's so important when you think about that, you know, in 2030, 90% of the jobs that'll be around and the opportunities don't aren't even existing yet they haven't been invented yet so the people that are starting to plan for their own businesses um, there's so many resources available um, but being able to see what problems you want to solve and, and figuring out how to do it and finding people to work with so we don't work by ourselves we have a number of, of nonprofits and others that we partner with because they have resources we don't have and we want to bring them to people as well and so it's always important to go out and find people to work with and people that can answer the questions that you don't have the answers to and and that'll know the things that you don't know and you never know who's going to introduce you to who 
And so what is the, what is the, the next step of the, found, of the Singleton Foundation now that you have developed several uh, digital uh, learning programs? What's, what is the next step? Is it a really now about distribution and getting it across the nation or across the world and in the way like a, 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 there's a similar group? Are you familiar with Khan Academy? I am familiar with Khan Academy and they have wonderful classes. Is, is this going to be, is this like a, something similar to, to Khan Academy where you're going to be offering a, a, a real depth and breadth of courses or are you going to always stick to, to, to the, the, the core concepts that you've described today? So, so we're about the core concept. So everything we do will focus on financial literacy, entrepreneurship, and that leads us into uh, learning about small business. And we're really about engagement and getting people to get started on these courses. We have access to a lot of resources, some that we've created, some that we're working with partner organizations to bring and looking for things that are um, high quality and that we know aren't just people trying to sell you something. Do you envision this going on to a television network so that people without internet access could see it or is it, will it always be web-based? Well, our home is mobile and web-based um, and we don't really know where the future is going to take us. Uh, we are also working on a, a video game that's all about starting businesses called Venture Valley uh, that'll be coming out um, to be announced. Um, but it's a competitive style game where you'll have the opportunity to play, um, see what it's like to have a business and learn the financial concepts that you need to know to run your business. Um, playing against, you can play with yourself, against bots, against friends, um, or against strangers, and that'll be a lot of fun to play. So, so you've had a really rich career of, of rising up through some of the world's biggest corporations and, and also startups and now the philanthropic world. How are the skills that you used in, in one of those arenas um, useful today? I mean, are, are these the same skills or have you had to learn different skills at every different level? I, I've had to learn new, new things every day and I still learn new things. I've been involved in some nonprofits uh, in different ways, sometimes on the board, sometimes as a volunteer. And this is really my first time being the business person inside of a nonprofit. So I'm having to learn a lot of new things. I'm having to learn new tax laws and different ways of thinking about things. And I think that's part of the fun is getting to learn something new every day and wherever you go. And even going to work every day at the Singleton Foundation, just talking to our team members and our vendors and different agencies we work with and different people that we have with our, on our shows. Um, I learn something new every single day and that's what makes it fun and exciting uh, because it helps us learn what to do to get the right information and the right resources to people. How, what is the history of the Singleton Foundation? Who, are, who is behind the foundation and how did it get started? What's really interesting, so it's a family foundation and it was started by Will and Carrie Singleton, who are a family. Um, and they started talking about the importance of financial literacy and entrepreneurship on their first date. Um, and they decided as they started dating and became more serious that they were going to create a foundation so that this is something that's personal to them and they've taken their personal funding to provide it so that we could build this organization and provide these services. And in your role as the CEO of the Singleton Foundation, do you have a responsibility for bringing more resources into the organization? Because you don't get sales, right? You, it's all Right, we don't get sales um, and so you know, they've been very generous and we're trying to figure out uh, different ways that to eventually become self-sufficient uh, without charging money for our services. Well, I, if you ever have an interest in bringing the program into jails and prisons, um, I hope that you'll consider collaborating with, with our team at Prison Professors. We're a small team. In fact, you're looking at the entire team right now. <laughs> but well, it's amazing what you guys are... Wait, you guys, and I'm referring to Michael in the plural, even though I know there's one of you, is, is very impressive, and I'm so excited to have learned about it. Well, we, we, try, to sh we try to show people inside that even if 
uh, you know, you, you went through 26 years in prison, you can come back to society and, and connect with uh, community leaders like you and even participate in some of your inspiring program as I had the honor of doing uh, by, by, uh, by participating in one of the episodes. So I just really wanna thank you for spending a half an hour with us. This is, this is uh, our time and I'm gonna spend the, the um, I'll do some writing show notes on it, uh, describing some of the takeaways that I would have gotten from this interview and we'll be distributing it to people who won't have access to your programming, but will have access to the, to the wisdom that you dispense today. And I, and I really wanna thank you for, for taking the time to speak with us. Well, Michael, thank you again for inviting me. I, I feel honored to get to participate in a meaningful program like the one that you're providing. Well, if you're in jail or prison and you've got a family member outside and you want them to develop more skills in financial literacy, I hope that you'll have them look at uh, programs like Faceplant. And what are some of the other programs called? Uh, we have Faceplant, we have Adulting, American Paycheck, Milk Money, and several other shows, and you can find them at millionstories.com. And I'll have a link to that in the show notes below. Um, again, I want to thank Shelly Miles, the CEO of the Singleton Foundation, for spending this afternoon with Prism Professors. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>